Thank you, folks. Well, as I always like to start out, I want to thank you folks for coming and being with us today. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoying the summer and getting an opportunity to go out and shoot pictures and so on. And, uh, you know, again, thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be with us today. I'm sorry? I thought somebody was saying something to me. Um, as Jennifer said, we're going to be going over the menus on Canon cameras, specifically the EOS 7D. And part of the reason for that is it's one of our more popular cameras. Uh, it's got an extremely comprehensive feature set and set of things in the menu. So by using this camera as a baseline uh, for our presentation today, we cover a lot of the things that are in many of the other cameras and some things that are going to be unique to the 7D. And uh, just a quick show of hands, how many people in here own a 7D right now? Okay, so a lot of you. Those of you who don't, or if you own another EOS camera besides a 7D, you're going to see a lot of things here that are familiar. But obviously, there are going to be some differences from one camera to another. You know, in just the same way that, you know, every car that Ford makes or that, you know, Toyota or Mercedes makes, every single different model, the dashboard and control layout isn't identical. It's kind of the same way with the menus in a Canon camera. Uh, they're, they're not going to be identical as you move from the Rebel series into a 50D, into a 7D, into, you know, a 1D Mark IV series camera. There are going to be some changes, some additions, etc. So don't freak out if you see things here that aren't in your camera uh, or that, uh, you know, if you see things here that, you know, just don't seem familiar. Uh, that's part of the reason we're here today is to go over this. Certainly ask any questions that you may have. Uh, and what we're going to do is go through the different menus and then depending on the amount of time we have, if time permits, we'll start going through some of the important custom functions as well. Uh, but this isn't a, a session on custom functions specifically. The idea is to give you a solid foundation about, as the title said, what's in the menu. What's in the camera's menu? How does it work? And give you some insight into it as well. Maybe hopefully go a little bit beyond what's in the instruction book. Um, you'll need to bear with me a little bit if it seems like I'm kind of looking off in space from time to time because when we plug the camera in for video out, I can't see the menu on the back of the camera, so I have to look over here or over here to see what's going on. So there are going to be some times where I'm kind of looking away from you folks, and believe me, it's not a, out of disrespect or anything. For starters, if you look at the menu on any recent Canon camera made in the last like four or five years, uh, you'll see that there is a, a familiar interface. And even though, you know, a, a Rebel may not have all the items that a 7D does, for example, uh, the, the way the menu is structured is pretty much the same. There are a series of tabs running across the top of the menu that basically give you different categories of items. Everything in red, the first set of tabs going from left to right, is what we call the shooting menu. Controls that have something to do with settings you make in terms of shooting a picture. The settings in blue are playback settings, having to do specifically with playing back your images on the LCD monitor in one way or another. And then the third set of settings with the little wrench icon are the setup menu settings that deal with actually, you know, setting up the camera for your preferences and so on. The little orange icon with the little camera on it is where your custom functions live. And then recent EOS cameras have a last one with a green star, which is called My Menu, and we'll get into that uh, toward the end. So we'll just kind of go through this in order. So starting with the first shooting menu, and you can see it's got a little dot, a single dot there indicating that's shooting menu number one, the next one is shooting menu number two with two dots and so on. So they've tried to do their best to keep this organized. Starting with the first item, quality. This is where you set whether, what image quality you want, what resolution, and whether you're shooting raw images or JPEG images or both. Now some cameras have additional ways to set this using a button on the outside of the camera. And we'll show you later on how you can use the set button to do this as well as kind of a shortcut. But by default, you go into the menu and here's where you tell the camera whether you want to shoot a raw image or if you didn't want to shoot a raw image, set, set it to the dash setting to just clear it and then set your preference on JPEG, hit the set button and you're good to go. The next item, red eye on, red eye off. It has to do with red eye reduction on your flash. Now, I'll be the first to admit, not just with Canon, but throughout most of the industry, red eye reduction in terms of what's in the camera is not really, really that effective. Uh, it can be useful if you're shooting something like a small baby in a crib and you're a few feet away, 
Don't expect that it's going to do anything for you if you're shooting a group picture of 40 people at a wedding and you're back 30 feet or whatever. It, it, it isn't going to. On Canon cameras, the way the red-eye reduction works, if you turn it on, is that a little white light literally comes on over here. It doesn't use repeating flash like some systems do for red-eye reduction. A little bright white light comes on, and the idea is that by shining that light for a couple of seconds prior to shooting the picture, that the subject's the pupils of the subject's eyes will contract a little bit, and if you do get red eye, it'll be a little less apparent in the finished picture. Uh, your choice whether you want to have it on or off. Yes, question? Yeah. Um, is there any downside to keeping it on? You use a little more battery power, and in some cases, it can delay the shutter release just a tick. You can notice that sometimes it, it sort of seems to hesitate a little bit, so if you're really trying for split-second timing, if it still works for you, great, but if you find it gets in the way, then turn it off. Excuse me. One other thing is that it does make you more conspicuous. So if you were trying to be as inconspicuous as possible shooting candids at a wedding reception or something like that, a little bright white light is shining, excuse me, a little bright white light is shining an instant before you take every picture. And that can sort of have people, you know, that were talking suddenly look over at the camera and like, you know, it's not a candid moment anymore. But again, you be the judge. Beep, on or off. Basically, the camera is going to give you a little chirp when you're in the one-shot autofocus mode and the camera has confirmed auto sharp focus and also if you're using the self-timer. Most of the time I leave this on because it's just useful to know but if you are working in a situation you know in a church service or something like that where you need to be discreet you need to be quiet it may be prudent to turn that off. Here's where you do it in the first shooting menu. Release shutter without card. This is something that we put in at the request of a lot of fast working professionals who from time to time would find themselves so caught up in the moment that they grab a camera out of their bag and throw a lens on it and just start firing away and realize wait there isn't a memory card in this you know which obviously isn't any good so by default the setting is enable and what that means is we're enabling you to release the shutter to fire the shutter without a card in the camera that way you can, you know, show the camera to your friends, you can play with the camera, you can, you know, just, you know, t test a couple of things in your living room, whatever. The camera will fire with or without a card in it. If you set this to disable, what you're telling the camera is, hey, if there is not a memory card in here, do not let me shoot. And what happens is you go to push the shutter button down, and it seems like nothing's happening except in the viewfinder and on the top panel, you'll see the word card displayed. And that means, hey, put a card in there before you can take a picture. Again, your choice as to whether you want to have that active or not. Yeah, the, the question was, did, the, did this menu item get renamed? And that's an interesting question in, the, in this regard. I mentioned before that the menus aren't going to be necessarily identical from one camera model to the next camera model. And sometimes that has to do with the wording as well as what the features are. So sometimes you have the same feature that can be worded a little differently on camera model A compared to camera model B, particularly if they came out at different times. Camera like the 7D was introduced about a year ago. Uh, you may have a camera like an original EOS 5D that was introduced about four or five years ago, and the wording may be slightly different. So that, that does happen. So if you see features in, the, in this menu here on the 7D that sort of look like they're what's in your camera, but boy, that isn't exactly the way it's worded, that's probably what's going on. Review time. Every time you take a picture, the camera by default shows you the last picture you've taken on the LCD monitor as soon as you take your finger off the shutter button. It gives you an automatic review of what you've shot without you having to press the playback button on the back of the camera. That's called review. And you have a choice of how long you want that review to be. Um, they give you a default, I think, of four seconds. But you can have less time if you want. You can turn it completely off if you find it distracting, or again, if you're working in a darkened area, like in a theater or something, you know, maybe you just don't want people around you to suddenly see this thing light up like a cell phone or something, uh, you know, while you're out there shooting pictures. So you can turn it off if you want. If you put it on the hold setting, what's going to happen is the camera will display the review, and that review will stay on the LCD monitor until you tap the shutter button and clear it. So if you really wanted to, you know, spend some time looking at this or hand the camera around to, you know, your friends or an art director or something like that to show just the last picture that you took, 
you can do it with the, with the review set to hold. If you press any of the buttons, the review is cleared. And then to get it back, you'd have to press the playback button. This is something, a feature that we've had on recent EOS models for like the last three or four years. So again, some of the older cameras won't have this. This is a feature called peripheral illumination correction. I would love to be able to sit here and tell you that we make the best lenses in the world, which I think we do, but I'd also love to be able to sit here and tell you that those lenses have absolutely no optical aberrations whatsoever. I'd love to sit here and tell you that there is no light fall off from center to corner on any of our lenses, but if I told you that, I'd be pulling your leg a little bit. All lenses do this to some degree, particularly if you're shooting at a fairly wide lens aperture. People shooting landscape pictures at f11, f16, this is almost a non-factor to them. But somebody who's doing a lot of low light work, or for that matter, just who's looking to get you know a uh, very narrow depth of field, blown out backgrounds, you know, th thrown out of focus, and is shooting at a wide aperture, you may notice if you have a scene with a lot of light colored, to light tone background that, hey, as you get towards the corner, it starts looking a little darker. That's a natural phenomenon called vignetting or peripheral illumination fall off, uh, as our engineers at Canon like to call it. What our engineers have done is come up with a technology to deal with that. And what they've done is examined every lens in our current lineup and quite a number of lenses that are now discontinued, but that many users are still taking pictures with. And they have mapped the characteristics of those lenses in terms of what do they do in terms of light fall off at different lens apertures, if it's a zoom lens at different zoom settings, uh, and even at different focusing distances. Because it, whether you're focused you know, 10 feet away or at infinity can have an effect on the light fall off characteristics of a given lens. So anyway, the cameras are smart enough to know when you put a lens on what lens you've mounted onto the camera. So if you go into this menu item, it'll tell you if the camera has in its memory bank information for the lens that's mounted on it at the moment. It knows the lens. And then you have the option to just let the camera do its thing and apply that correction. Or if you're a purist and you say, no, if there's any correction like that, I want to take care of it myself in Photoshop or whatever, you can turn it off. If you shoot JPEG images with a peripheral illumination correction on, it's corrected as the image is processed and written onto your memory card. If you shoot raw images, the image is tagged with that information. Then if you take that raw image and process it using Canon's Digital Photo Professional software, you have the ability in the software to let the correction happen automatically, or again, you can fine tune it or even turn it off there if you wanted to. Third party software, we get this question all the time. Well, what if I use Adobe's Camera Raw or Apple's Aperture or some other third party raw file processor? Then you're up to them in terms of whether they have gone and done the homework and you know, they can read the Canon tags or not. Many third party processors cannot. Some can. I can't sit here and tell you a list of who can and who can't, but if you're interested, you can contact, you can either try it. Uh, you know, take a shot with it on and off and see if you notice a difference when you process your files that way. Or you can, you know, go on that company's website or contact the representatives and just ask them. Nope. The question was, every time you put a different lens on the camera, do you have to re-enable it? The answer is no. Now, the only exception would be if, let me backtrack for a second. The camera comes out of the box from the factory with information for, for about 25 or 30 different lenses in its memory. It can hold information for about 40. We have a list on our, in the, in actually uh, the uh, Canon EOS utility software, if you have the latest version of that, there is a list of every single lens that our engineers have mapped out, including some that are discontinued, as well as newly introduced lenses too. So the camera comes, like I say, preset with some lenses that the engineers figure are likely candidates that a user of this type of camera may have. If you put a lens on, though, and you see it says correction data not available, what it means is that that information isn't in your camera. If you wanted to apply it, the next time you're at the computer, connect the camera with a USB cable, fire up your EOS utility software, and go into you know, camera settings and into peripheral illumination correction and find the lens you want, 
put a check mark by it. You may want to check a few others as well that maybe you're thinking I may be using down the road or something. And then upload that into your camera. Like I say, there's room for about 40 lenses in the camera in terms of keeping this information in the camera body. If you're really trying to get, you know, to really stock up, you may find that, you know, hey, I need to delete some of those lenses that are in my camera now. You can do that too in the EOS Utility software. You can, it'll show you a list of the lenses you have. And again, each one that you have will be checked. And if there's one that you say, wait a minute, you know, I don't use the 18 to 55 little compact zoom lens with my camera anymore. It came with that, but I've, I've stopped using that one or something. You can delete that one so that it's not in there. Any other lenses you don't own, you can delete as well so that they're not in the camera's memory anymore, making space for new lenses you may want to put in. So that's what the peripheral illumination really correction is about. Lenses, right? That's correct. The question was it's only for Canon lenses. That's correct. We can't be responsible for mapping out the correction qualities of third-party company lenses. Uh, so you're, you're on your own as far as those are concerned. Recent cameras have another very cool feature and in the first shooting menu, and that's flash control. Used to be, if you were a flash shooter, just using an EO speed light, uh, that if you wanted to make settings on the flash, whether you wanted to just you know, simply you know, do uh, something fairly minor or whether you wanted to do something elaborate like wireless ETTL or something, you had to use the settings on the flash's LCD panel, which, you know, it's fairly small. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And a lot of it is done with these little kind of arcane icons that if you know what you're doing and you understand what they mean, no problem. But if you haven't picked the flash up in a couple of months, it can have you scratching your head. So they have simplified our lives greatly on recent EOS models by giving us flash control in the camera. Now there are a couple of ground rules. First off, you have to have a camera that's capable of it. If you're using an older camera model, like an, an original EOS 5D or a Rebel XT or something like that that was introduced a number of years back, it's not going to have that technology. And number two, even if you're using a new current camera model like a 7D or something like that, which certainly has the flash control menu, as far as external flashes are concerned, it's got to be one of the newer compatible units, a 580EX2, a 430EX2, or the new 270EX little compact flash. Those will talk to the camera and let you do flash control on the camera menu, which is a lot simpler. If you own an older speed light, it'll otherwise work fine. If you have a 580EX, not the two, but the original 580EX, or a 430EX, or the original 550EX, or something like that, you can use them on these cameras. The ETTL still works, the wireless ETTL works if the flash is compatible with that, but the menu on the camera won't. Okay, so just understand that. Anyway, in terms of what's in this menu, first item, it says flash firing. Enable, disable. And you may wonder, why in the heck would I want to, if I put a flash on the camera, why would I want to disable it? What's the point of that? The reason that's there is for those photographers who shoot available light, but who are working in extremely dark, challenging conditions and want the benefit of a focus assist beam from the flash to help them focus, autofocus, in very, very dim lighting conditions. This way they can put a speed light on the camera, it'll fire the focus assist beam, but it won't fire during actual picture taking. So that's why the disable setting is there. Obviously, you know, most of us are going to leave it to enable. In other words, let the flash fire when I take a flash picture or, or so on. They've split up the settings for built-in flash on the 7D uh, and external flash settings. So We'll go through the built-in flash settings first real quick. If I press the set button and go in there, the first setting I have is the flash mode. ETTL means the automatic through the lens flash metering done Canon style. 7D is the first Canon camera with a built-in flash that'll let you do manual mode flash, full power, half power, quarter power with a built-in flash. Uh, any of our previous cameras didn't have this. And you can also do multi-flash. This doesn't mean wireless ETTL. Multi-flash means during a fairly long exposure, a series of stroboscopic multiple pops. Pop, 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 pop. So you get multiple flash bursts in the same picture. Obviously, it's a specialized kind of thing, not something you're going to do all the time. But it is there. But that's what you have in terms of flash modes. Uh, obviously, for most of us, leaving it on ETTL is going to be where we're going to be most of the time. Choice of first curtain or a second curtain shutter sync. 
You'll notice high speed is grayed out. The built-in flash is not compatible with high speed sync. When we get to an external flash, an EOS EX series speed light, then you have high speed sync available to you. Exposure compensation. Some of the cameras have a button, like the 7D, there's a, there's a button on the top of the camera that you can push and then quickly turn a dial to dial your flash compensation up or down. But you have the option of setting it in the menu as well. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, could I explain first and second curtain? I'm sorry I kind of danced through that quickly. First and second curtain sync, or synchronization as it's sometimes called, refers to when you take a flash picture, when is the flash going to fire? Is it going to fire right at the beginning of the exposure, as soon as the shutter is fully opened, which is the default? Or if you're taking a long exposure uh, where there may be movement during the exposure, it could be, you know, a, a 15th of a second, a quarter of a second, it could be several seconds long, whatever. If you're taking any form of a long exposure, do you want the flash to fire at the end of that exposure instead of at the beginning? Sometimes if you have, like for instance, a person walking diagonally toward the camera and they're holding something, I, I did this once with somebody holding a birthday cake with candles on it, and they're kind of walking towards the, you know, towards the camera and during a, a, like a, a two second long exposure, obviously in a darkened area, and what you get is this natural looking trail of these candles and all, and then at the end of the exposure, when they're closest to the camera, the flash fires, and you get what appears to be kind of a natural looking progression of movement. That's what second curtain sync is, that's firing the flash at the end of a long exposure. Now if you set it to second curtain, and you're outside in bright sunlight shooting at, you know, 125th or 200, 250th of a second, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can set it to second curtain, it's not going to have any effect on you. You wouldn't notice the difference visually from that to a standard first curtain sync uh, shot. The reason people ask, well how come, you know, if, if, if the slow sync and second curtain is so cool for my long exposures, how come whenever I set a long exposure, that's not just the factory default, how come I have to set it there? The reason is because when you put it on second curtain sync, you're not really in command of the instant the flash is going to fire unless you're in bulb mode and you take your finger off the camera you know, to stop the exposure. But if you're taking like a four second exposure or a, you know, a half second exposure or whatever, you're not really in charge of the decisive moment anymore. So that's why the engineers say, okay, we're going to let you be in charge of the decisive moment by default and if you want to change that, Mr. or Mrs. Photographer, have at it. So that's the purpose of the first and second curtain sync and why second curtain sync is an option, not the default. Does that answer your question okay? ETTL2. This one can seem a little confusing. When you're taking flash pictures with our camera, whether you're using the built-in flash or for that matter an external accessory speed light, doesn't matter. The way ETTL flash metering works is it tends to concentrate on the areas of your scene, regardless of whether they're in the middle, off to one side, taking up the whole picture, whatever. It tends to concentrate on a shot-by-shot -shot basis on those areas that give back the most reflection of a pre-flash that's fired. That can often be good, but sometimes you can run into situations where it can get kind of inordinately fooled by somebody wearing like a white shirt or something like that, and it can give you kind of erratic exposures. We run into this frequently, particularly with the older cameras. It's gotten progressively better and better with more recent cameras like the 7Ds and the, the new 1D Mark IV and so on. Uh, but even there, you can run into this sometimes where you, you may be shooting run and gun style at something like a wedding reception or something, and you're saying, hey, I'm getting inconsistent exposures. Uh, well, by setting this from evaluative to average, what you're doing is you're telling the system, hey, instead of concentrating on one area of the scene that tends to give back the most reflection, just read the whole scene. Average it all out. So sometimes you can end up with a little better consistency of exposure on your flash picture shot to shot if you set it to average. It's not a magic wand, but sometimes you can find that helpful. And that's whether you're using the built-in flash or an accessory speed light. Wireless function. 7D is the first camera in our lineup where we can use the built-in flash to trigger off-camera speed lights with wireless ETTL. And it can be one flash off the camera, it could be an unlimited number of flashes off the camera. It's a very cool feature. 
Uh, we call it the integrated speed light transmitter. The question was, does the camera flash have to fire during exposure? The answer is no, it doesn't. Uh, but and I'll show you why real quick. And we'll kind of go through here quickly. Don't worry about the details of this. Just understand the power that's potentially here at your fingertips if you own a 7D. Okay, and certainly if there are any specific detail questions you folks have, I'll be glad to go over any of that with you after our session is completed. By default, wireless ETTL is disabled. When you pick the camera up, you can activate your built-in flash and it's intended just for taking snaps. Uh, it's not going to fire accessory speed lights. If I go into here though, then I've got other choices. The disable setting is important because even if I want to use this, use the built-in flash on the 7D to trigger wireless speed lights and do all kinds of other cool stuff, if I later on decide, hey, I just want to take some quick snaps and use the built-in flash, if you've got it set to any of these wireless settings, the power of the built-in flash to just take snaps is greatly reduced for technical reasons. So, if you don't want wireless, make sure you have it turned off to disable. If you, yes, question. So let's say, let's say I, I've used it before, so if I take off the, let's say I don't have to have the camera flash, and I just want to use the, the internal flash, right, then that power is less. Right, anytime you've, it, the question was, it, turn that off. It, the, the, que the gentleman's question was just to, you know, ask me to elaborate on that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. It, by all the pre-flash signaling it has to do, the built-in flash, if you've got it set to any wireless setting, there's a lot less power available for firing during an actual picture. So like I say, if you're not doing wireless and you want to use the built-in flash, turn the wireless off. Turn it to disable. Anyway, in terms of the settings, real quickly, that the 7D offers, you can have an unlimited number of external speed lights, slave units, they can be mixed models, they can be, you know, an old 550EX and a new 580EX2 or whatever. You can have all those set up on your scene and you can have all of them fire together and set a ratio between them as one group and the built-in flash as another group. That's what the first setting is. And you see there's a little icon here that symbolizes external flash and a little icon that symbolizes built-in flash. Or, I can tell the system, hey, I don't want the built-in flash to fire during a wireless shot. I want just my speed lights off the camera to fire. That would be this one. You got the symbol for just speed, accessory speed lights, not wireless. So let's just say I set that. I can now go down two notches to firing group, and I can tell the system, hey, I want all the external flashes the fire as one, at, as one group at even power. Or I can tell it, hey, I want to set up a ratio of A units to B units. I would have to identify each of the so-called slave units. I'd have to tell it, you're an A, you're a B, and you set that on the panel here. Or, oops, I'm sorry. Or you can set an A to B to C ratio as well. So you can have three different groups that you can trigger from the camera position, triggering them with a built-in flash. Yeah, there's some finite limits as to how far the built-in flash will reach. Out to about 25 feet straight ahead, out to about 16, 18 feet at an angle, is about its working range. It's not going to light up the inside of Yankee Stadium at night or something like that. It's, you can't daisy chain them together. Uh, so, I mean, it has limitations. But on the other hand, in a lot of situations, it's an extremely practical way of working with wireless and something that we haven't had in our system for a while. And then finally, you've got this option, which is sort of the same, only different. This is external flash plus built-in flash. Not a ratio of the two, but plus. So what we're doing here is you can have an unlimited number of slave units off the camera, external speed lights, and you can have them all fire evenly, or you can have them fire at the ratios I showed you before. You set that in the firing group here. And the built-in flash will fire a modest amount of fill. Now the key word there is modest. Okay, if you're doing a head and shoulder portrait of somebody and you're six or eight feet away, it'll give you a modest amount of frontal fill. In that situation, it'll work. Again, to use the analogy of a wedding, 
If you're, you know, you've got 50 people lined up on the church steps and you're trying to take a group picture and you're back 35 feet, it's not going to fill in. Okay, it just isn't powerful enough. So there's a finite limit as to what it can do. But anyway, that's, what, that's the business about the internal flash, the built-in flash, acting as an integrated speed light transmitter with the 7D. First camera, and to date, the only EOS camera with that capability. Yes? So now if you put the, the, um, an external flash on the option, right, and you have it on wireless, which means the power back? If that's, first off, you can't use the built-in flash with a flash on the hot shoe. No, I'm not worried about that. Yeah, then the ask that question a different way. Um, but you have the thing, you have the whole, you have a system set for wireless, right? Yeah. Um, and put the, 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 the hot shoe then. And you put them so called master unit on the camera. Yeah, yeah. It would just be, it would just be normal. You can, it would work the same as it would when you were setting it the old fashioned way. You can, and I'll show you that in a minute. You can have the, the gentleman's question was if you use a, a speed light on the camera as a triggering device, as a so called master unit which is the way we've had to do it up to now. You can set it on the menu and you can set it so that it fires your flashes evenly. You can fire it at an A, a to B ratio, A to B to C ratio, and you can tell it whether this fires or doesn't fire during ex actual exposure. So whether you have frontal fill or not. Yeah, you can do all of that too. Can you explain in another way? Yeah. Does this have to be up for the wireless to be effective or it can be down? The only way, it can, the only way you can do it down is if you've got either a speed light on the camera or an STE2 e2 transmitter on the camera to do wireless flash. Otherwise, the built-in flash has to be up. So it gives you, you know, you, it's, just, it's another choice in terms of triggering wireless flashes. Okay, one more, and then I want to move on. Yes. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right. Basically, you can, all you're doing here is just adding the ability to fire to trigger wireless flashes without accessories, with using the built-in flash, which is already there. Sure. Okay. So back out of here. External flash function settings, and you'll notice if I don't have an external flash on the camera, and I go into here, it says no, nope, no can do. Basically, it doesn't have anything to communicate with. So if we put an external flash on, turn it on and do it again. Now all of a sudden, bingo, we got a menu. And now we can do, whether we're just talking a single flash on the camera or whether you want to do wireless ETTL, you can do pretty much all you want using the camera's menu. And the benefit of this, as I said, is it's spelled out in English a little better. You can see it much bigger and you're not using quite the same arcane little icons and so on to make your settings. Some of this stuff is going to be a repeat of what you saw before. The flash mode. Whether you shoot manual, multiple, which again is stroboscopic or ETTL, that can be set here for your accessory speed light. Shutter sync, first and second curtain as we explained, and also you have the ability to set high speed sync here. So if you want to shoot at shutter speeds faster than your camera's normal maximum sync, you can do it with fully automatic flash control. And the only trade-off is that as your shutter speeds get progressively higher, the relative flash power becomes progressively weaker for technical reasons. You don't have the same flash power at a 250th of a second, if that's what your camera's maximum sync speed is. You don't have the same flash power there as you do at, say, a 4,000th of a second. At a 4,000th of a second, the amount of flash power is substantially less. You need to be closer to your subjects. But this is where you'd set it. Flash exposure bracketing. You can set it on the speed light itself. You can also set it here. Bracket your exposure so you can take three shots and you can tell it, hey, take the first one right on, the second one under, the third one over. And you can tell it how far over or underexposed you want them to be. Now, interestingly, unlike regular ambient exposure bracketing, flash exposure bracketing by default does cancel itself after you take the three shots. There is a way to make it stay active if you wanted to do it continuously, if you were doing like a whole bunch of repeating group pictures at a wedding or something like that. Uh, but by default, you take the three bracketed flash shots, and then it just goes back to normal shooting. Flash exposure compensation, again, you can set it on the, extra, on the outside of the camera with most of our cameras, uh, but you can set it in the menu as well. I explained about the ETTL flash metering. Normally, you'd leave it set to evaluative, but if you're finding that you're getting some 
inconsistencies, you know, some stuff that seems inexplicably, you know, a shot under, a shot over, doesn't seem like it's making sense, try setting it to average and see if that changes as you do run and gun type shooting like at a wedding reception or something like that. The flashes zoom head setting. Normally it's on auto, but if you want, you can manually set it here and dial it into whatever focal length or spread of light you want, whether or not it matches the lens. You may want kind of like a spotlight effect on your flash in certain situations, even if you're using a wide angle lens. Well, here's what you do. You set it to a higher number and then just hit the set button and bingo, you could be shooting this with a 24 millimeter lens, but you've got the flash set to, to light up the area of a 105 millimeter lens. So you're going to have like a bit of a sort of semi-spot effect in the picture, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, by and large, you know, most people are going to leave this on the auto setting and let it just widen and narrow its beam depending on the lens you have on the camera. Yes? Does it come, when you shoot? come again? Does it come when you shoot? I, it, I, I misunderstood the first thing you said. Does it what? Is it canceling? Oh, is it canceling? It basically, no. If you set it manually, the question was, if you set it manually, is it canceling? No. If you set it manually, it stays there. Kind of like driving a car with a manual transmission. You put the thing in second gear, it's going to stay in second gear until you move it somewhere else. It's not like an automatic transmission that'll, you know, shift on its own. Again, you got the ability to do wireless ETTL and make all your settings at the camera, which is so much simpler than having to do it on the little LCD panel on the back of the speed light. I won't go into great detail here, except to say that when you do this, you can see the menu grows, and now you have the ability, this question was asked earlier, you know, Matt, having the flash on the camera, do you want it to fire during actual picture taking or not? In other words, it can act as just a triggering device and not fire with master flash set to disable. If you set master flash to enable, that means it's going to fire during the actual exposure, so you get fill from the camera. Your choice. You can set the channel that you're on, the ratios all firing together, A to B ratio, A to B to C. Flash compensation, and so on. External flash custom function settings. These speed lights have gotten so sophisticated, the flashes themselves have custom functions. And depending on the speed light, there's a varying number of them. You can set them, once again, on the camera menu. You can go in here and set each function. And the cool thing is, it tells you the function number, but it also tells you what does the function do. And then just like setting a camera custom function, if you wanted to change it, you can highlight it by pressing the set button, then go down to the other choice. This would be changing the order of flash bracketing, which shot is taken first. The default is the normal exposure. You can tell us, set it so that the negative, the, the underexposed shot comes first instead if you wanted to. And it's set just like a camera custom function. So you can do that for the flash custom functions as well, which is pretty neat. That's the first shooting menu. Second shooting menu, exposure compensation and auto exposure bracketing. Auto exposure bracketing meaning bracketing for regular ambient light pictures. We're not talking flash anymore. What this is going to let you do is Set your exposure, comp set exposure compensation here if you want, but the cool thing is if you go to the top main dial on the camera, that's the dial up by the shutter button, if you go to that with this menu displayed, you can now dial in your auto exposure bracketing. You can tell it the range of stops you want it to be, and you can even combine it with exposure compensation. There's two little icons here. This icon means quick control dial on the back of the camera, and you can see that applies to your flash compensation. And below it, auto exposure bracketing, that dial is the top main dial, the little icon there. And that gets repeated throughout the menus here. So anyway, if I go to this, I can set what I want. I can use flash compensation and move the whole bracketed range if I want to. And then just tap the shutter button to hit the set button first. Make sure you hit the set button first. You see down here, it says set. And then OK. What that means, that's set in a little in the little rectangle there means you got to hit that button to make it kick in. And I'm guilty of this a lot, of going and making a, you know, figuring out an auto bracketing setting, dialing it in, and then in my haste just picking the camera up and tapping the shutter button halfway to clear the menu and start shooting. If I don't hit the set button, guess what? It isn't doing bracketing. So hit the set button first, now you're good to go. And you can even see 
that it knows that I've got three bracketed shots there. Yes? Yes. The general young lady's question was, is that setting on the 5D Mark II? And that, that is. That's common now among most of our cameras. Auto lighting optimizer <laughs> is another of those new technologies for image control uh, that is going to basically try to help you get more detail in your shadows if you're shooting a contrasty picture or if you're shooting a very flat kind of picture. That is, if you're out on a foggy morning or something with very low contrast, if the system senses that there's very little contrast in the image, it'll actually try to do a tone curve adjustment and ramp that up a little bit. That's auto lighting optimizer. You are in control of how much its effects are. Its effects are usually fairly subtle. It's not like a major curves adjustment in Photoshop. But you still have the ability to go in and make that effect strong, standard, which is the factory default, very subtle, or you can turn it off altogether. There's some photographers who say, wait a minute, I don't want the camera monkey in with the tone curve on my pictures. You know, whether it's because you're doing studio lighting and you're setting up your ratios very carefully or whether it's just because you, you like the idea of controlling it yourself in Photoshop or in the camera, you can do it yourself if you want to. Just turn it off. Uh, it tag, the question was, is it doing it in RAW? It tags a RAW image with that information. And again, if you process it in our software and don't do anything, by default, it'll do whatever it was tagged with. You can go in and change that if you want to. In third-party software, Sometimes it will. A lot of times it's ignored. Somebody else had a question. Okay. White balance. Sounds fairly self-explanatory. Again, most of the cameras have a button on the camera where you can call this menu up without having to go into the camera menu to do it. But you do have the option of doing it in the menu if you want to. Auto white balance. Locking it in for daylight. Shade. Cloudy. Cloudy can be kind of an interesting one, even if you're not shooting on a cloudy day. And really the same with shade, too. If you, you know, most of us are tuned into, most humans are tuned into liking colors that are a little on the warm side, particularly when we're talking flesh tones and so on. Uh, we tend to like faces to look, if they're not going to look dead, dead on accurate, we tend to like it when there's a little more of a golden look than when there's a clammy blue look. And you can get that deliberately, even on, at high noon, on a clear day, by setting the camera to the cloudy white balance setting, and you can get it even stronger if you set it to the shade white balance setting. I'm not saying you should always take your pictures there. Just understand that it's an option available to you that you may want to experiment with from time to time. Tungsten white balance setting for regular household tungsten lights, not for the new low voltage uh, you know, snow cone looking lights. Uh, which can be all over the ballpark in terms of white balance figures. <coughs> fluorescent, which again, there's like about 40 or 50 different types of fluorescent bulbs sold in the U.S. market. Obviously, we can't white balance for every single one perfectly, but it's a starting point. Flash, the built-in flash or an external speed light has a tendency to look a little blue compared to midday sunlight. The flash white balance setting warms it up just a skosh. And again, you can use it for regular daylight shooting. In fact, if you like that idea of warming the tones up just a little. Custom white balance. I have no idea why the industry is sta stabilized on this little funky icon here with the two triangles and the oval in the middle, but that means custom white balance. It's not a Canon thing. That's industry-wide. And then you can set the white balance in degrees Kelvin as well. This can be kind of neat because if you're shooting with a tungsten balance light source or a daylight balance source, whether it's sunlight, whether it's flash, whatever, you can vary in very, very fine increments. And you see that icon again for the main dial on top of the camera. That's this dial right here. You can adjust this in very fine increments. And as you go higher, you're telling the system, hey, expect very blue light, so dial in a lot more warmth to neutralize it. So you can get a warmer effect by going to the high numbers. Conversely, you can get a more blue and moody effect by dialing in a low Kelvin number. It's the, it's the opposite of what most people think. Most people think low Kelvin numbers means a tungsten-ish kind of light source that's very amber. So Shouldn't, if I set it to a low Kelvin number, shouldn't the white balance be very amber looking? No, you're telling the system, hey, 
expect that kind of light source and counter it to make it look neutral. What's it going to do? It's going to pump in a bunch of blue. So that's what the Kelvin white balance is about. It can give you, again, the, the thing I like about it is very, very fine control if you want to exercise it. This one's an interesting one. White balance shift and white balance bracketing. We just showed you there's a whole bunch of white balance options that you have, and you can use any of them. But no matter which one you use, whether it's auto, whether it's one of the presets, even if it's custom, you still have the ability to go in and change the tint, if you will, of the picture further if you want to. You got on this graph here a dot, and you can move that dot in using the uh, multi-control dial, multi-controller on the back of the camera, it's like a little joystick right here. You can move that in the amber direction, you see the letter A and then sort of an orange stripe here, which means you're moving towards amber, or it's opposite, which would be blue, you see a blue stripe there. You got green with a letter G and a green stripe, and you've also got magenta and kind of a pinkish stripe down here. And what this is letting you do is you can dial in a further adjustment on white balance here if you want to. And modify it even more. So if you did, like, let's just say you did a custom white balance and then you really wanted to get it, just tweak it a little more. Here's where you can tweak it. And if you think about it and you say, yeah, good idea, but maybe I just, just leave it alone. Well, you see it says info telling me if I hit the info button on the back of the camera, it says clear all. So if I hit the info button, it just goes back to the center. White balance shift is what this is. And you can see it's, it, it says the word shift down here. And these little arrows indicate that that's the multi-controller that would do it. White balance shift can be an interesting tool from time to time. A lot of people don't use it, but that is what it's here for. Now you also, if you go to the quick control dial on the back of the camera, you got the ability to do white balance bracketing. Each of these increments, you got nine increments in, either, in any of the directions. Each of these increments is extremely fine. Okay, if I go from 0 to 9 and take a picture at 0 and a picture at, say, 9 amber, for instance, yeah, you'll see a visible difference in, in the pictures. One of them is going to look a lot warmer than the other. But if I go from 0 to 1 or 2, the differences are pretty subtle. But if you want to have just that subtle variation, you can go to your quick control dial, turn it one direction, and dial in up to 3, no more than 3 bracketed steps. And the camera, this is interesting, You'll take one picture, and the camera will put three copies on your memory card. One with the color right on. In this case, one with the color a little blue. And in another case, one with the color a little amber. And like I say, the, the decision of one, two, or three notches is pretty subtle. But if you're thinking that, hey, I'd really like to just make a little adjustment here, that does let you do it. Yes? Um, so when you're doing bracket shots, you're actually getting like nine photos? That's right. The gentleman's question was, if, I, if you combine this with real auto bracketing, regular auto exposure bracketing, where the images are lightened and darkened, you get nine shots. Uh, as they say in the military, that's affirmative. Um, it would literally give you three variations of each of the three exposure settings. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to play with. Turn the quick control dial one way, you get this. Turn it the other direction, you can bracket in the green magenta direction. I don't use this very often. But there are some people very, very picky about their color that do find this to be a very useful tool. You can, but the point is you can do it here. And if you're a JPEG shooter, this can be a very useful thing. And some people have to shoot JPEGs or just simply prefer to shoot JPEGs. Color space. We get this question a lot. What color space should I use? And this is where you'd set it. The choice is standard sRGB or the wider gamut Adobe RGB. Your choice. Uh, basically, obviously, if you're shooting a raw image, to a certain extent it doesn't matter because you can reset it when you process the image. So if you set it in one place and you need to process it a different way, you can do it. If you're shooting JPEGs, you really want to get it right, though. And a large part of what's the right answer for this depends on what you think you're going to be doing with the files. What is the most likely use of them? If they are going to be output on the web, on a standard inkjet printer, on you know PowerPoint or something like that, 
understand that a lot of those devices are not Adobe RGB savvy. And if you give it an Adobe RGB image and the image has a lot of very bright saturated colors, there can be a mismatch and you can get some weird surprises where that bright red Corvette sort of suddenly becomes kind of maroon or something. On the other hand, if you're expecting that, hey, I may, you know, I, I'm really, you know, looking to have these, I'm hoping I can get these published in a, in a high-end magazine, uh, or I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, take one of these and, you know, make a, a really nice print with a good wide format inkjet printer, you know, hopefully a Canon printer, but even if it's a third-party printer, uh, then going to the Adobe RGB space, if the output device is going to be Adobe RGB savvy, then it makes a lot of sense. We get wedding photographers, I keep bringing up the example of wedding photographers, but it is something that most of us, whether we shoot professionally or not, can relate to. We get a lot of wedding photographers asking us this at the wedding trade shows and stuff, and we tell them, go to your lab and ask the lab, what sort of devices do they use when they print their proofs, when they print up their books and stuff? If they look at you funny when you say, should I shoot Adobe RGB or sRGB, if they go, huh? The answer is shoot sRGB. <laughs> um, on the other hand, you know, if they say, oh, <laughs> or, or that too. <laughs> Young ladies, I do, or go, go to another lab. But on the other hand, if they say, hey, you know, when, when we print on our, you know, XYZ type printer and everything, you know, it's, it's, timed into, it's, it's tied into the Adobe RGB color space, hey, shoot the images Adobe RGB. Picture style. Oh, you, you had a question. Come again? Gentleman's question was, is there a special advantage of Adobe RGB? And actually, that's a good question, which I kind of danced over. Adobe RGB, basically, in very simple terms, I'm not a color scientist, I'm not going to pretend I am, but in simple terms, Adobe RGB encompasses a broader range of possible colors than the standard sRGB space does. The difference lies in some of the very bright, saturated type of colors. In other words, if you take a portrait of me wearing this beige shirt, against a white or a black background, there's not a lot of saturated color there. It's not going to make a heck of a lot of difference. On the other hand, if I'm wearing a bright Hawaiian print shirt and you wanted to get that accurate, Adobe RGB has the potential to have a few more tones in the lime green areas and the bright purples and reds and so on uh, if you're going to be outputting it to a device that does understand Adobe RGB. Now again, if you're using a $99 desktop printer, it probably doesn't. So you can be actually, it can be counterproductive if you shoot it in Adobe RGB and then send it to a device that doesn't understand Adobe RGB. So that's the difference. A lot, as Americans, we're taught to think that more must be better. Sometimes it is, but it depends. Picture style. Picture style is going to let you go in and change the look of your photographs. Uh, and if you're shooting JPEGs or if you're shooting movies with our cameras that have the HD video capability, this becomes an important setting. If you shoot RAW files, again, as with most of these settings in RAW, you can set it one place in the camera, but then you can completely override it when you process the image. And some third-party RAW file processors now uh, are beginning to become savvy to manufacturers' tags on these kind of things and read them and try to do their best to emulate them as well. Simply stated, you have six starting points. Standard, portrait, landscape, neutral, faithful, and monochrome, which is black and white. Each one is a different flavor. When they first came out, the analogy we gave is it's kind of like choosing among different types of slide film for people that back in the old days that you know, shot 35 millimeter slide film. And there were differences from one film to another. There were films that did a nice job with you know, smooth, soft skin tones. There were other films that did a much better job with like bright fall foliage colors and that kind of thing. And photographers would use you know, different types of film for different types of subject matter. Picture style basically lets you do that now in the camera. And then within each picture style, you can see here it says info and then detail settings. You can go in, whoops, hit the wrong button. There we go. You can go in and you can independently further fine tune the sharpness, the contrast, the level of color saturation, or what they call color tone. And color tone basically is you start at a neutral point in the middle. You can warm the picture up by going on the minus side by adding magenta, 
kind of a pinkish tone, or you can warm it up by going to the plus side and adding kind of a yellowish tone. So your choice, you can warm the tones up moving in the yellow direction or moving in a magenta direction if you want to further fine tune it. One of the things, oops, that's what I wanted to do. In general, the camera comes at the standard setting, appropriately enough, out of the box. The standard setting intends to give you snappier contrast, more sharpening, and more color saturation. For video, most critical users find it's too much. And in bright sunlight for stills, you may find it's a little bit too much of a circus kind of look. Which one is the right one to go with is kind of a personal taste thing. Most of the time, I spend my time in the neutral setting. It's a lot kinder, gentler file. It is a little flatter. So on a you know, foggy morning, maybe that's not the way to go. Maybe standard is actually better then. Um, but usually I'm at neutral or, or standard. That's just me. There are different opinions on what works best. One great thing to do is if you do shoot raw images is to open an image in DPP and just go into the picture style palette in digital photo professional software and just play with the different settings. Try it with a picture you took on a bright sunny day. Try it with a picture you took indoors uh, in available light. Try it with a picture you shot on an overcast day with very soft lighting. See what the differences are. See what floats your boat. You know, if, you're, if you print, make some different prints and see what, you know, just sort of see what, what you like and find, you know, what's going to be your comfort zone. There is no one right setting for every single situation. Okay, it's, it's shooting uh, something outside in bright sunlight is different than shooting something with soft boxes in a studio. So you may find that you're, you know, moving around on the picture style menu a little bit, but that's okay. Dust Elite Data. Again, something mo some of our recent cameras have. Dust Elite Data lets you take a test shot, a specialized test shot, and the camera literally maps the location and size of any dust that may be stuck on your imaging sensor, and then it tags every image you take after that with that information. Again, if you then process those images, if they're raw files, or if you just simply open them, if they're JPEGs, in Canon's digital photo professional software, it'll automatically identify that dust and clone it out for you before you send the image off to Photoshop or whatever, saving you from having to do it manually. The cameras have a very effective dust reduction system, which involves moving the imaging sensor and a host of other things. But sometimes, even you know, the best laid plans can go awry, and you may find that there's a little you know, piece or two of dust that's you know, visible in some of your shots. If you, if you go to Dust Elite Data and go in there, it basically wants, if you go to OK here, and you can see I haven't done it on this particular camera yet because it'll tell you the last time you did it. But if I move the OK, it's going to ask me to take a test shot of a white object, a piece of paper or moving close to the wall or something like that, with a lens about 50 millimeters or a little longer. And it's going to ask me to preset the focus to infinity and then switch it to manual focus. And then from a distance of about a foot away, now I know that doesn't make sense, a foot away, focus to infinity, trust me, it works. You're taking a test shot where the camera can read and respond to the location of any dust, and then, like I say, map it and tag that information on any picture you take after that. The test shot, incidentally, is not saved on your memory card. The information is, but you're not literally taking a picture on your card when you do that. So that's what Dust Elite Data is about. One Touch RAW plus JPEG is something unique to the 7D, at least up to now anyway. Uh, the 7D has a button on the back of the camera, right up here, that says RAW JPEG. And what it lets you do, you press that button, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. You press that button, if you're shooting RAW images, the next shot you take, there'll be a JPEG taken with it. And if you're shooting JPEG images, if you press that button, the next shot you take, will be a RAW plus JPEG. In other words, there'll be two files on the memory card. You know, what you were set for, and then the other one, a RAW or a JPEG as well. And what you do here is, if you're shooting JPEG images, you can tell it, hey, when I press this button, here's the type of RAW image I want to have in addition. Or, if I'm shooting RAW files, you can say, hey, 
Here's the type of JPEG I'd like to have in addition. It can be a full resolution, best quality JPEG. It can be a small JPEG if you want just something that you can send out for email or whatever. So that's what that's about. And again, that's unique to the 7D at this point. You won't see it if you have another camera up to now anyway. Your live view settings. Live view is kind of a neat feature on these cameras. Uh, the ability to actually you know, view and compose your pictures using the LCD monitor instead of the viewfinder is great when you're working down low and in some other situations too. First off, you, you tell the camera here whether you want to shoot live view or not. So you can turn it off if you don't want to. If you're afraid if I hit the button, I'm going to lock the mirror up and all that stuff. If you don't want to do that, disable it. But if you want to, make sure it's on enable. Three choices for autofocus when you're in live view. The so-called live mode, which is going to read focus off the imaging sensor. Face detect live mode, which also reads focus off the imaging sensor, but now is looking for human faces. And what it's going to do is it's going to concentrate on the nearest and largest face that it sees in the frame, assuming it's a human face that it can recognize. Uh, it doesn't work with animals, and you know, Halloween masks may not work either. But you know, with humans that are basically somewhat facing the camera, they can be turned a little bit to the side, but you can't, it can't be a profile or something. It's got to be kind of a face. Uh, the camera will identify a face and focus on it. This can be useful if you're trying to shoot relatively quickly uh, in a situation, once again, like at a, you know, a party or something like that, and you're using live view. Quick mode is perhaps arguably the most useful of the live view focusing methods because it uses the regular focusing system in the camera, not reading off the imaging sensor. So the focusing is faster. The only catch is it has to interrupt live view for a moment to do it. Uh, so when you push your finger on the shutter button or push the AF on button on the back, for a moment you'll hear what it sounds like a click. You're not taking a picture. What happens is the mirror is going back down again. The camera's autofocusing system is now, the regular autofocusing system is kicking in for a second. And then if you're in one shot, you hear a little beep beep, and that means you're in focus. And take your thumb off the back button or, or just take your finger off the shutter button lightly and bingo, you're back in live view, in focus now and good to go. You can have a grid display to keep lines straight and so on on your live view screen. A choice of a, a kind of a coarse grid or a fine grid, your choice, or you can leave it off. Exposure simulation. A lot of studio photographers and folks doing that kind of work are finding that live view is actually a very practical tool, particularly if the camera is going to be mounted in locations other than just like, you know, at eye level on a tripod. If they've got a camera, you know, mounted looking down at a product or something or at a very low angle, Live view, being able to view off the screen here, can be very, very useful. The camera by default is set up, or most of the cameras are set up, to give you a good view on the screen in terms of brightness and so on, regardless of what your actual exposure is. Uh, but, actually the 7D deviates from that by using a technique they call exposure simulation. And what that means is that the live view, we'll go to live view here for a second so you can see what I'm talking about. There we go. With exposure simulation on, I'm focusing on these cameras here, we'll let it focus there. And if I go to my exposure compensation and darken it, why aren't you darkening? it? Oops, hang on a sec. That's weird, it wasn't doing it. All right. Anyway, I'll explain what it's doing, what it's supposed to be doing. I don't know why it wasn't doing it. There's something I wasn't doing right. But basically, exposure simulation darkens or lightens the live view based on what the actual camera exposure settings are. So in other words, if I raise my shutter speed, it'll look a little darker. If I widen my aperture, it'll start looking a little brighter. That can be good if you're letting if if you're basing your exposure on what the camera is set for. But if you're shooting flash pictures, or if you're shooting studio flash pictures, it can't make that adjustment. And so what'll happen is you may end up, you know, if you set the camera for indoor flash pictures at a 60th of a second at f8, that's fine for the flash. But for exposure simulation, it's, you're going to be looking at a black screen, which isn't good. So if you turn exposure simulation off, now what's going to happen is the camera's just going to give you a, what it thinks is a clean view. Uh, and it won't monitor what the actual exposure settings would be. When you take the picture, the image, the review image that comes up on, up on the screen will obviously tell you how your exposure settings worked out. Silent shooting during live view. This is pretty cool too. Disable means that 
it's not active. It's going to fire the shutter normally when you take a live view picture. But some of our cameras, including the 7D, use a technology on the imaging sensor where the sensor can act as a first shutter curtain. And it cuts the noise down considerably. Mode 1 cuts it down noticeably and still allows you to shoot continuous pictures. Mode 2 limits you to single frames only. But now you've got a shutter firing that is almost silent. Uh, and the other thing that's cool is when you press the shutter button down, if you hold it down after the picture's taken, the noise of the camera recocking the shutter won't occur until you take your finger off the button. So if you're in a situation like if you were at a golf tournament or if you were at a very, you know, like a, a classical music performance or something and you really needed to be quiet at all costs, you could take a picture and hold the button down for a moment until you hear the uh, crescendo out of the orchestra or until you hear, you know, some applause after the golfer has finished his swing or whatever. Then take your thumb off the button and the, sh the little whir sound of the shutter recocking itself uh, won't be offensive. So mode two on the silent shooting, can, in live view only, can be actually a very cool thing. Metering timer, that's how long the meter is going to stay active when you're in live view. The default is 16 seconds. You can vary it depending on how long you want the meter to stay active. Your playback menu. First item is protect images. You can go through your images. And it'll ask you, okay, you know, go through your images, and if you find one that you say, okay, well, you know, here's one I want to, I definitely want to make sure that I don't accidentally erase it. If I hit the set button, you can see in the upper left here, the set icon and a little key icon next to it. And what that means is if I hit the set button, now you can see this little icon appeared. I've literally protected this image against accidental erasure. And I can go through the rest of the images on my card. And, you know, if I see another one, okay, maybe here's one I want to do it as well. Hit the set button, and again, a little icon appears. I've protected it against erasure. Now, it won't protect it against formatting the card. It protects it against erasing the card, which is not the same thing. So, some people will say, well, it's of limited use, and that's fine. But that's what the protect image setting is for. Uh, to protect you from, even if you, set, even if you go into the menu and say, okay, erase all, it won't erase those ones you've protected. But understand, again, if you format the card, all bets are off. Rotate. Rotate your images. And basically, the purpose of this is if you were in a situation, and we get, there's a separate set, setting called auto-rotate as well. If you shoot an image and it just doesn't play back right, even if you got auto-rotate set, and you shoot, say, a, a horizontal image, and for some reason it's playing back vertical, okay, you can go right in here, hit the set button, and you can orient it the way so it'll play back properly. That's there. The rotate setting there in the playback menu is there for like those one-off instances where for some reason it just didn't come through right. Erase images. I don't recommend you make liberal use of this. First off, there's a button on the camera to let you erase Im to let you get into erasing images anyway, but there is a menu setting as well. And you can, with the first one, you can select individual images and tell it, okay, I want to erase it. And if you hit the little garbage can icon, or rather the set button, you can see, okay, you put a check mark there, and you can see next to it, the number one, it means on this card, there's one image I'm going to erase. Maybe I go through and I find another one. It's like, okay, maybe I want to erase this one. So I hit the set button again. Bingo, there's a check mark here saying I'm going to erase this image. And it's saying, hey, there's a total of two images on the card that are marked for erasure, and so on. You can also erase all images in a folder or all images on a card. Frankly, going in and erasing images on the card frequently is, a, is risky business. Not only because you might erase something accidentally, but because you kind of leave a lot of breadcrumbs on the card. If you erase an image here, erase an image there, erase an image there, shoot more images, erase an image. I'm not saying don't ever do it. Sometimes you want to just, you know, during a quiet moment, you shoot a bunch of pictures, and during a quiet moment, you want to go through your pictures and, okay, you know, here's one where the subject blinked or something. I know I'm not going to need that, so just get it out of there. Simplifying your editing before you ever get to the computer. To a certain extent, it's okay. But don't get in a habit of going crazy erasing half or three-quarters of the images on your cards. If you're looking to clean a card off, 
you should be formatting it instead, and we'll get to that in a moment. Print order. I want to go through this quickly, but basically, a lot of people don't realize this. If you have an inkjet printer with PictBridge capability, we like it if it's a Canon brand printer, but it doesn't even have to be. It can be an HP. It can be an Epson. Anything with PictBridge capability, you can actually connect the camera with a USB cable to your printer, and you can print without a computer. This can be kind of cool if you're at an event or something like that, and you just want to hand out a bunch of prints to people that you've shot that day. Uh, you can go in here into print order, you can select individual images, scroll through them, and if you find one you like, just hit the set button, Oops, and it's telling me it's unselectable because it happens to be a raw file. Depending on the printer that's connected, now obviously there's no printer connected here, but depending on the printer connected, you may be able to print raw images. And you can do a lot of other stuff depending on the printer, the menu settings and so on that you see on screen will vary depending on the printer that's connected. You can change things like paper size, uh, you can say bordered or borderless, and a whole bunch of other things once you have it connected to a PicBridge compatible printer. So it's actually kind of neat. No, it obviously is not going to give you the control that printing from Photoshop would. But you can do a lot of quick stuff on location this way using the print command. So that's what, that, that's, what that's for. And again, it can be kind of a useful thing. Highlight alert. These are the blinking highlights, you know, that flash on and off on your camera. And basically, if you set this to enable and then start playing back images, you can see any overexposed areas will blink on and off, giving you a warning that, hey, this, you know, you, you may have an exposure problem here. Now it's up to you. Does it matter or not? Uh, yes? question was, and it's a good question, uh, it's, because it's something we've asked for, and the answer up to now is no, but the question was, there is a highlight alert with the blinking highlights. Uh, will we ever see a shadow alert where underexposed areas that are bordering on being a pure black would blink in some way as well? That's something we've asked our engineers for. DPP software, our digital photo professional software, can show you that, but in the camera, we don't have that capability, at least not yet. You bet. So highlight alert up to you whether you want to leave it on or off. There are times it can be very useful for spotting mistakes. AF point display. You can set the camera so that it'll display what AF point you used to take a given picture. In this case, one big point is telling us we used live view to take a picture there. But if this was you know, using the 19 point system, we'd see a smaller point. Maybe we'd see a bunch of points. And it'll do it for you know, the rest of the pictures you have. The little red square is telling you, hey, here's where you focused. And this can be kind of useful in tracing problems and stuff like that. And also just to sort of see, okay, you know, it's, you know, after you took all those hundreds of pictures at that particular event, geez, did, I, did I use automatic point selection? Did I manually focus? Where did I focus? Well, it's an easy way to tell, just looking in the camera. Histogram display. When you're playing your images back, you press the info button and display a histogram. Do you want it to be the standard brightness histogram that comes up first? Or do you want an RGB histogram that shows you the three separate color channels? Most people are content with just the brightness histogram coming up first. Uh, and if you do leave it on the brightness setting, what's going to happen is, again, we'll play back an image here. Whoops. We'll play back an image. If you hit the info button once, you get a detailed view of information. Hit it again, you get the brightness histogram. Hit it again, you get a brightness and an RGB histogram. So why the menu setting giving you a choice of brightness or RGB? It's what's going to come up first. When you had just the solo, the one histogram, that's your choice of brightness or RGB. And then, like I said, the next press of the info button, you get both of them anyway. Oops. Slideshow. One of the cool things you have now is the ability to actually look at your images on a TV set. It can be a standard definition TV. Uh, or it can be, you know, one of the newer high-def TVs. Uh, many of our newer cameras now have an HDMI output so that you'll get high-def images appearing on a TV set. And you can actually play back, if you go into the slideshow setting, you can actually play back all the images on your card or you can go in and select individual images too if you want. You can get all in a folder, you can take all the images that you shot on a given date, just all your movies or all your stills, 
So the different categories you can pick. And then basically you can tell the system, okay, play the images back. And when you go down to setup, oops, you can tell it how long you want each one to play. And it'll automatically play them for that length of time. And then once you've done that, you can say, do you want it to loop repeatedly or do you want it to just play once and stop? So it's a nice way to just, you know, quickly show people, you know, folks at home or whatever. Or even if you're in a business application, if you run a studio or something, this can be a very quick way of reviewing pictures with your client on a big TV screen, not on a little computer monitor. Uh, and, you know, get, do, do it in an impressive setting. They can, you know, sit on your nice leather sofa and, you know, really sit back and enjoy your pictures and, you know, maybe make their choices that way. So that's an option you have for playing back your images is to use the slideshow feature. Big cards, memory cards these days, you know, with, you know, dozens of gigabytes of capability, of capacity, allow us to shoot, like, lots of pictures at a time. You know, we can end up with a card, you know, if we go traveling, you know, you take a 16 or a 32 gigabyte card, I mean, you can put hundreds of pictures, even raw files, on that card. And if you want to go through them, and you've got that many pictures on a card, sometimes scrolling individually through each picture as you play them back can be kind of a pain in the neck. So you do have the so-called jump feature. And what that's going to let you do, if you turn, you see the little icon here, which means the top main dial. If you play them back, you hit the playback button, and then turn the top main dial, it dictates how are you going to scroll through your images. You can scroll through them one image at a time, jump 10 images, jump 100 images. You can jump by date. So if you were on a trip to Europe and you had everything on one 32 gigabyte card, you can show, you know, you can see the pictures from the first day, jump to the second day, jump to the third day. You can, if you've set up different folders on the memory card, I'll show you how to do that in a few minutes, you can jump by folders or you can jump from all your movies to all your stills. So that can be a quick way of playing your images back in the camera. This has nothing to do with what happens in terms of downloading to the computer or anything. This is strictly when you're in the field, it's a quiet moment, now you want to see what's on your card and you've got a lot of images to look at. If, you, if it's too many to scroll through one at a time, jump is a shortcut to let you do that. Yes, question. I'm sorry, come again? Honestly, I don't remember off the top of my head, to be honest. I'll, I'll play with it after we're done and take a look and I'll, I can give you an answer. Just off the top of my head, I'm just, I don't remember that setting. In terms of the setup menus, there's three of them. Auto power off. By default, the camera comes at one minute. Auto power off is, is a battery saving feature. Uh, you, whether you shot pictures with the camera or you just, you know, picked it up and played with it or handed it to your friend to show him your new camera or whatever it is, uh, you know, you put the camera down or you just, you know, you stop shooting and put it around your shoulder. You're not touching any more buttons. How long is it going to take the camera to go to sleep? And that's up to you. <laughs> Basically, it's, you know you, you know, you can dictate the amount of time. The longer the amount of time, the longer it's going to stay awake. In other words, the longer it's going to be before it goes to sleep. The disadvantage of that, of course, is you are going to use a little more battery power as the time gets progressively longer. The advantage, though, is if you're in a situation where something may happen and you may want to pick the camera up quickly and just start shooting, you're not going to have to kind of wait a couple, you know, one Mississippi, two Mississippi for the camera to kind of wake up and get sort of get its, you know, gather its collective breath. If you set it to the off setting, what you've done is you've told the camera, hey, don't go to sleep. That does mean you're going to use more battery power. The only way the camera is going to get turned off now is if you go to your on off switch and physically turn the camera off. But at the same time, it means that the camera is always going to be ready to shoot in certain kinds of tethered to the computer shooting or remote controlled shooting. That can be very important. So you do have that ability in auto power off to disable the auto power off completely so the camera never goes to sleep. And it's up to you whether you use it for ordinary shooting. I'm perfectly comfortable leaving it on like a, you know, a minute, two minutes. For our purposes today, since, you know, I may be talking for a few moments, I don't want the camera to go to sleep while I'm talking, we've set it to about eight minutes, which certainly should be comfortable for that. But, you know, again, you be the judge. Auto rotate. I told you before in the playback menu, there's a rotate setting where if you play an image back and it just isn't right, you can move it. Auto rotate, though, tags every pic. Do you have a question back there? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I thought I had a question. I thought you had a question. Auto rotate tags every image you take, telling it, hey, when we play it back on the camera's monitor, and you see there's a little icon there with a the camera, and when we play it back in the computer, whether it's using Canon software or some other browsing software, when we're looking at our thumbnails and so on, it's telling us, it's telling the system, hey, orient the pictures what we think is correctly. Now you've got a couple of options here. The standard one is that every image you take on the camera and on the computer is going to be rotated, whether you shot it horizontal or vertical, it's going to be rotated to what the, what the system thinks is normal. For playing back in the camera, it presumes that you're going to be viewing it, not necessarily shooting it, but that you're going to be viewing it with the camera horizontal. Like your hand holding the camera, I may take a couple of vertical shots of a portrait or something, but then I just, you know, I look at the pictures and the camera, I'm holding the camera in the normal horizontal orientation. But there are situations, you may have the camera on a tripod and be shooting vertical pictures. And, you know, you take the pictures and you want to see them, and you don't want to turn your head sideways, and you don't want to turn the camera vertically, it's on a tripod, it's in a fixed position. That's a situation where you might set it here. So you're telling the system, hey, rotate these when they get in the computer, but don't rotate them in the camera. Because I, I want them to play back vertically because I got the camera held vertically. So that's, it's an option that's available to you. And then some people just prefer to have any tags for rotation turned off. So you can do that too. And normally, you know, leaving it at the first setting is going to be fine for 98% of us, 98% of the time. But you do have the other options there as well. Format is going to format the memory card. Basically, wipe it clean. So I recommend this anytime you are going to use, reuse a card, but I also recommend that you make real sure that you have safely gotten your images onto a hard drive or some other off-camera source for holding them before you do this. Technically, I'll tell you a little, it's not really a secret. I was going to say it's a dirty little secret, and it's not really a secret, but if you format a card accidentally, or just format a card, period, technically what you've done is you've taken the directory structure, the street sign, so to speak, and you basically knocked them down. But the image data technically is still there. If you ever accidentally format a card and then you have one of those oh no moments, Understand that there are lots of data recovery software that if you do nothing else to the card, if you just take the card and put it in your pocket, don't shoot any more pictures on it, you can recover the images. It's when you start shooting again, you've marked those areas to be replaced with new images or new data. So if you put that card in the camera and now go shooting pictures, now you're, you're literally overwriting whatever was on there. But like I say, formatting a card is you're 90% of the way towards wiping it clean, but you do still have the ability with various third-party software or whatever to go back and recover most of the time. Yes? That's a good question. Young lady's question was, young lady's question was, can you format a card an infinite number of times? Effectively, the answer is yes. I'm not a card, man Ken is not a card manufacturer. I'm not going to say I'm a technical expert on, you know, the engineering of memory cards, but in practical terms, the way a photographer would format a card over and over again, not somebody in a test lab doing it literally a million times or something, but in practical terms, yes, you can format a card over and over again and can, you know, keep on using it. And it's a good idea to format it, frankly, before you reuse it again, as long as you're sure that everything's copied safely. Yes. Well, again, if, if you, the key thing is, the gentleman's question was, if you make a mistake, is there a way to get them back? Uh, whether it's, you know, deleting with formatting or even erasing. The answer is, usually you can. But the key thing is, do not shoot or add anything onto the card. Just stop what you're doing, put the card in a safe place, 
and you know then go to some data recovery software or there are even firms like drive savers is one firm and there are others that there are firms that specialize in recovering data that normally can do that so the manufacturers like Lexar and Sandisk, I think on their website it's free yeah they, they, that's a good point I mean a lot of the big card manufacturers you know like a Sandisk and Lexar for instance uh, usually have some form of data recovery software for their own cards that's available that you can download usually free sometimes at a modest cost so that's an option too I don't want to you know I don't want to overstate this just understand formatting a card is a good thing you don't want to make a mistake but if you do make a mistake you, there is a fallback to some degree yes one last question and we got to run right right yeah exactly and on the CF card cameras, you don't have the ability to low-level format. A low-level format is a very clean wiping. Uh, ironically, on our cameras that do have SD memory cards, like our new Rebel series and so on, there's an option for a low-level format on those cards when you hit format. You don't see that on the 7D here. File numbering. This is something that makes people crazy and it's hard to wrap their minds around. And I'm going to try and go through this quickly. File numbering is the little numbers like IMG underscore, you know, one, two, three, four dot JPG or dot CR2. When you take each picture, it comes with a unique number, a four digit number. And this is something that a lot of people end up having problems with. First off, a couple of things. File numbering, number one, does not tell you how many pictures the camera shutter is fired. End of story. Okay, get that, get that real clear. Point two, the camera comes set for continuous file numbering. That's the default. Now, you have other options, too, as you can see, but before we get into those. Continuous file numbering means I've got images on this card. Let's say the last image I took was number 4567, just hypothetically. And I go and shoot another picture. That's going to be 4568. I shoot two more pictures, 4569, 4570, and so on. If I take that card out and I put a freshly formatted card in, not a brand new card, but just a card that's been formatted, or if I put the card in, format it, and then take another picture, the camera knows what the last picture it took was. <laughs> and if it sees a formatted, clean card, it'll carry off where it left off. So if the last one was, whatever, what did I say, 4570 or something, the next one would be 71. The next picture would be 72. And I can keep doing that. If I keep feeding it fresh cards and keep doing it, it'll just sequentially number up to 9999, and then it'll just go back to 0001 and start again. Now, here's where the fun comes in. Camera also recognizes what is on the card if I put a card in. So if I take a card that has some images on it, doesn't matter even if this camera took it, it could be from a a point-and-shoot camera, doesn't matter. If I put that card in and I don't format it, if I just say, oh, I gotta shoot quick, a card out of my pocket, put it in, and go, the camera now looks at two things. It knows the last number it assigned, and it also sees the number on the card, if it sees images on the card, photo, you know, photographic images. It compares the two. Whatever number is higher, that's the number it adds one to for the next picture I take. So I could go, I could, I could have been at 4569, 4570, 4571. If I put a card in and its last image was 8888, camera looks at that and says, oh, that's higher. And if I don't format that card, next shot I take is going to be 8889. That's the way continuous file numbering works. It just keeps adding one, and if you put a card in with images and you don't format it, it looks and whatever number is higher, it adds one to it and keeps on going. Yes? Yeah, that's more than likely. They just, they just took a, t the gentleman's question was that that may have happened during a, when he sent the camera in for service. And yeah, they test the camera, put a card in, and just you know, shoot a few pictures to make sure it's working right and everything. And, you know, again, if they didn't r format the card first, that, that's what'll happen. It'll jump. So it doesn't mean they went and shot, you know, 7,000 pictures with your camera. They didn't take it to Hawaii on vacation with them. <laughs> <laughs> Auto reset is the second option. 
Auto reset means anytime I put a freshly formatted card in, or if I take a card that's got data on it, but before I shoot pictures, I format it in the camera, and then I shoot, it goes back to zero. So I could be shooting pictures with card A, and be at, you know, image number 2222, 2223, 2224, take card A out and put card B in, format card B, and then shoot my next picture, it's going to be 0001. Auto reset means anytime a formatted card is in the camera, it's going to reset to zero. Or zero one, I should say. And then sequentially number them from there. And, you know, next shot would be number two, number three, number four, etc. Manual reset lets you, regardless of which of these first two you are at, manual reset lets you immediately jump back to zero, 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 one. So I could be on continuous shooting, or continuous numbering, excuse me. And if I just say, I, I want to make sure I don't mix my numbers up with my colleague who's also shooting pictures here, I want to reset my camera to zero. If I go to manual reset, what's going to happen is the camera is going to write a new folder on the memory card. The images I take are going to go in that folder, and it's going to start at 0001. Any images I already had on the card are going to stay where they were. They, they, they could be anywhere. But it's going to just be a new folder on the memory card, and it's going to reset to 0001, and then the camera goes back to whatever I had it set to. So if I set it to manual reset, you can see it doesn't say manual reset. Manual reset is like a spring-loaded setting. It knows you want it to reset it, and it's going to create a new folder, but it jumps right back then to continuous or auto reset, whatever you were set to. So that's what file numbering is about. And unfortunately, no, you can't go and, you know, you can't just start at 0000, zero, zero, zero in, a, in a different way. You can't start at an arbitrary number. If you want to start at 7500, you can't just set the camera at 7500 if, that's, if you just wanted to do that out of the blue. Uh, you can't break the file structure uh, of that. The 1D series cameras do allow you, the EOS 1Ds and the 1DS series cameras, do allow you to change the first three characters so that instead of IMG, you can set it to whatever you want. You can set it to a four digit, a four character code so you can put like, you know, Mike or NYC or, you know, whatever, something that can identify it. But only the 1Ds let you do that. Uh, the 7Ds, the 5Ds, the Rebels, and so on do not. Is that a question? Yeah, my question was prefixing, and I think you just answered it. Okay, gentlemen, we had a question about prefixing, and it just, I just addressed that. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump ahead of you. No, not the, the gentleman's question was does changing folders on the memory card allow you to change the prefix on the file numbers? The answer is no, unfortunately it doesn't. Yes. On the auto reset, if you put an unformatted card in, it's still okay. Yeah. The gentleman's question was if you Yeah, gentleman's question was on auto reset, if you put a new card in it has images and you don't format it, does it compare? Yes it does. And since it's not a freshly formatted card, once again it looks at the two numbers, whichever is higher. It's going to pick up from there and continually number upward. But it only resets if, if it's a clean card formatted. Select folder. By default, you put a card in the camera, you format it, and you start shooting. One folder for images is created. And by default, it's number 100. And you can keep right on shooting and put every image you want into that folder. Every image, you, I should say, you can put every image you take into that folder. But the system does give you the ability to create additional folders for images on that memory card in the camera. And the reason for that is so that you can do a preliminary job of organizing your files. You may imagine being a newspaper photographer and you got to shoot an event in the morning. Maybe you got to go to City Hall to shoot a presentation or something. Uh, you got an event in the afternoon where you're doing I don't know some society uh, event, a you know, charity event or something like that. And then maybe you got a sporting event at night that you got to shoot. Maybe you got to go to a, you know, a Yankee game or a Knicks game or something like that and photograph there. You got three things you got to do during the day. And maybe you want to put them all on one card. Maybe you got, you know, a big 32 gig card and you know that they'll all fit on there and they're all in one place and that's fine. Okay? What you can do if you want to separate those images so that when you get back to the computer it's easier to sort of keep them separate is you can create a new folder. If you go to this setting create folder and hit the set button it's going to ask you, do you want to create a new folder? And you highlight OK, turn the dial, highlight OK, and hit Set. And you've now created a new folder. 
you see the list of folders that you have created on the card and it tells you here the folder number how many images are in that folder at the moment and then if I select one of those folders it shows me the first image in that folder and the last image in that folder so that I can identify them real quick so that if I'm that news photographer I can say uh, yeah okay that this is the one that had the uh, the ball game in it this is the one that had that society event in it and so on so this can be actually kind of useful in terms of you know just very quickly sorting through your images if you're putting a lot of stuff on one memory card and you can go back and I mean you can in other words obviously folder number z 100 was the first one they done chronologically no unfortunately you can't go in and rename these folders this is just a sign by the camera and that's it but just because I shot this one took did this one first and then subsequently added others I can go back and I can select this folder again hit set and I can now go and shoot more images and they'll go back into that folder so that could be the images I took in the morning and I could take images late at night in that same folder if I wanted to so just because you've created additional folders doesn't mean that you can't go back in time and put new images in an older folder yes you can't delete the, not, the question was can you delete a folder and the answer is no you can't delete a folder in the camera you'd have to do it in the computer with a card reader or something LCD brightness, probably self-explanatory. Now, one interesting thing is you won't see LCD brightness on the video out. So if I adjust it here, you're not going to see it. Our newer cameras, like the 5D Mark II and the 7D, you have the ability to adjust the brightness automatically. Let the camera adjust it for you, or you can manually adjust it yourself. And you can see, once again, that's done with the main dial on top of the camera. And then with the quick control dial, which is the large dial on the back of the camera here, I can turn that dial and we can you know literally adjust the brightness you get differing opinions about where the brightness should be you get some photographers saying oh you should always adjust the LCD brightness all the way to the top you get some saying hey adjust it just depending on the lighting you're in whatever floats your boat I'm not gonna tell you that there's one setting that's best you gotta sort of figure that out yourself once you've done it make sure you hit the set button to lock it in whatever you decide on date and time sounds fairly self-explanatory uh, you should set it as accurately as you reasonably can once you set it there's a built-in backup battery in the camera so that even if you take the main battery out it'll keep the time for a period of several weeks uh, without a battery installed in it before it eventually loses its punch uh, but it's always a good idea to have that set as accurately as you reasonably can entirely up to you if you go traveling somewhere in different time zones whether you want to reset it I like to do that some people prefer to leave it on their home clock setting again whatever floats your boat but it's a good idea not to have this at a, just a random setting. Set it to the accurate setting, and then you kind of know when you took your pictures and so on. Language. Kind of a remarkable thing if you really stop and think about it. We take it for granted that you can buy a camera today, and it's got the ability to give you all these different menu settings in like 25, 26 different languages. And you know, I mean, obviously, if English isn't your first language, you want to set it to your language of choice. Now, I want to point something out to you real quick. You'll see that by the word language, there's a little icon, looks like a little speech bubble, you know, like on a cartoon. That's important because if one of your friends decides to do you a favor and sets it to, for instance, Russian, and then you pick the camera up later that day or a day later or something, and you're saying, oh my God, how do I get it back to English? and you don't know that the word yazik means language <laughs> you can just look for the little speech bubble and you say okay I found the speech bubble now hit the set button okay now you know go back to whatever my language of choice is whether it's English or something else I understand not everybody in the room may be English as a native speaker but you got like 26 different choices there I think it's 26 I didn't count them up uh, so probably there's something that'll work for you video system there are basically two, and this refers to what's going to happen when you're playing video out of the camera. In other words, when you want to show images on a TV, you're bringing images directly into an LCD projector or something like that. This has nothing to do, well, nothing directly to do with if you're using the video recording feature that's in a lot of the newer cameras. Okay? What this, basically NTSC is the system used in North America, in Japan, and a few other places in the world. The so-called PAL system or its sister CCAM is used in most of Asia, Europe, and in a lot of other places. 
If you're looking to play images back on a TV in one of those areas, just make sure it's set properly so, so that you can do it. The one place that that has an influence when you're shooting video is that if you set it to the PAL setting, your top frames per second rate on most of the cameras, instead of being 60 frames a second, will be 50 frames a second. And instead of 24 frames a second, you get 25 frames a second, which is sort of in tune with the PAL system. Uh, so that's the only shooting wise, the only difference that your choice of video system makes there. And, and make a note of the fact too, if you do shoot HD video with a 7D or one of these cameras, that this video system menu is not in the movie menu. It's not when you're shooting, it's not in the regular video menu, it's in the setup menu. Sensor cleaning. I mentioned before that the camera's got a pretty effective system of dust removal, dust reduction. And one of the aspects of that is the ability for the sensor to literally clean itself. Auto cleaning means that when you turn the camera on or turn it off, it's going to spend a couple of seconds literally vibrating the sensor at an extremely high frequency to shake off any dust or dirt or whatever that may be clinging to the front of the sensor. By default, it does that automatically. If you wanted for it not to do that for whatever reason, you can disable that. Normally, I recommend just leave it on. I, I, there are a few reasons I can see for turning it off, but there are circumstances where you might. Clean now means just that. Press that button and the system is literally going to stop what it's doing and it's going to vibrate that sensor. And on most of our cameras, it'll also move the shutter a couple of times. So you hear sort of a click, click, click. It's literally moving the shutter blades to make sure that any crud that may be on them is physically shaken off as well. You are not taking pictures when that happens. Okay, all it's doing is just literally moving the blades. It's not recording anything. It's a little different. Instead of the auto cleaning, you're literally going to open the shutter up, pop the mirror up, and it's going to give you the ability to go in without being in the bulb mode and taking a long exposure and literally blow dust off the sensor. Okay? We do not officially recommend touching the sensor with anything. I know there are third party sensor cleaning swabs out there and so on. <coughs> officially, Canon's recommendation is don't use them. You're, if you do, you're on your own. It's using those third, we get this question all the time, so very quickly I'll say this and then move on. Using these, sens these third party sensor cleaning devices that are kind of like a high tech Q-tip, if you will, that you know, literally wipe the sensor clean. The front of that sensor is extremely delicate. And using those devices is kind of like crossing the street. It's not hard to do, but you don't want to screw it up. <laughs> Viewfinder grid display in the 7D. This, you won't see this in cameras like the 5D. The 7D has an LCD overlay over its focusing screen. You can literally have a grid display there if you want. If you, by default, it's off. But if you want to, you can turn a grid display on so that when you bring the 7D up to your eye, you literally will see little grid lines, architectural grid lines in your viewfinder. Not on the live view screen, but literally in your viewfinder. And it, it's kind of a cool feature. Again, right now, unique to the 7D. Battery info. This one's kind of neat. The newer cameras are using a more sophisticated battery that can literally give you very precise information. If you press the set button and go into this, you'll see literally the battery that you're using, now you see two of them here because this camera has the battery grip on it and it happens to have two batteries in it. So smart enough to know that and report the status of both of them. You can see here the percentage of charge left in each one. It tells you how many times I fired the shutter since those batteries were recharged. And the reason that you see it's down like 15% and we've only fired like three shots or two shots is because we've been using the menu so much. And then below it, you see this thing called recharge performance in these three little green squares. Basically, that is monitoring how well the batteries can hold a charge over time. It's not how much charge is left them at the moment. That's up here. What this is, is basically as you reach, batteries have a finite number of cycles of charge, discharge, charge, discharge that they can go through. And eventually, they start losing their punch. You know, just like folks like me get old and we, you know, we're not like we were in our 20s, yeah, the batteries kind of get like that too in a sense. And what will happen is you start off with three green squares. When it senses that the battery is losing its punch, you'll go to two green squares, one green square, and then you get to a point where that one green square turns into a red square. When you get to one red square, it's telling you, hey, this battery, no matter how much you charge it, is not really going to give you much performance. It's time to discard it and replace it with a new battery. 
Not just simply charge it, but you know, buy a new battery and replace it. You know, normally these batteries have you know, you know, roughly 500 or so cycles of charge and discharge or more built into them. Uh, but you know, eventually you're going to reach the end of the road, as with you know, most devices. And it's just telling you, hey, here's the way your batteries are holding up long term. As far as what's going on with this battery right at the moment, that's the percentage number up here. And you get a little graphic up here as well. Yes? How many days uh, does the battery lose its power, let's say, after you uh, charge it? Because I have a battery, after I, I charged it, after a week, it lost its uh, power. It, batteries can, you know, the gentleman's question was, how long will a battery hold its power if you charge it up and then just leave it sit? Any storage battery is going to lose power over time. Now, it shouldn't be losing, a healthy battery shouldn't be dead after a week. Um, you know, registering a weaker number and that, you know, instead of 85% re registering, you know, 70% or something like that, that's reasonable. I don't have an exact figure to give you, and it does depend on which battery we're talking about because we make more than that LPE6 battery that's in the 7D. But it should, you know, a good battery should, let, you know, not lose much within a week. I'll, I'll certainly say that. Uh, you don't want to leave a battery sitting around for a month or so before you use it, though, if that's at all possible. In other words, charge it up, leave it sit for a month. That you probably don't want to do if you can help it. Yes? When you're using the uh, battery grips with two batteries, are both batteries discharged equally? That's a good question. The gentleman's question was if you're using the battery grip and you've got two batteries in it, are they discharged equally? The system, the way our system works, it looks at the strength of the two batteries separately. Looks at one, looks at the other. Whichever one is stronger, if, if one is stronger, it goes with that one first. When the first one reaches the level of the second one, then they are used equally. That's the way our system works, whether you're talking this camera or any of the other cameras that can put two batteries in a battery grip. Info button display options. If I play my images back, and I hit the info button, Every time I hit it, I get a little different view. A view with a lot of information, view with a histogram, view with two histograms, large screen with no information, and so on. If I go back into the menu here. Come on, guy. <laughs> Takes a moment to kick in. Now, come on, please. Anytime. I apologize for that. Basically, what we're saying is, oh, I, did, I showed you the wrong thing. What I meant to show you was what's happening when we're, when we're actually live. But what's, you can display on the 7D, you can, you've got a choice of displaying regular camera settings, the electronic level, or shooting functions. So let me show you that one more time real quick. I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong thing and I went to playback, which I shouldn't have. That's camera settings. Frankly, I never found this to be particularly useful, but some people do. It tells you all the different things the camera's set for, how, how long you set it to sleep, what color temperature you got it set to on white balance, and so on. This is the electronic level display. This is cool. <laughs> this thing, if you shoot tripod pictures and you're not using one of these, you don't know, and you got a 7D, you don't know what you're missing. This is cool. And this, is shooting settings. Kind of duplicating what's on the top LCD panel. This can be actually very useful when you want to see everything at a glance. If you're working quickly, if you're like me and you know your eyes aren't what they used to be in terms of you know reading this versus reading this all spelled out on the monitor, this can all be kind of neat. So every time you hit the info button, you can call up one of these things. And again, you can say, hey, I want to call up each of these, or if there's something you didn't want to call up, just highlight it and then hit the set button. If there's no check mark there, it's not going to show when you hit the set button in real life. And then just go down and highlight OK, and you're good to go. Camera user settings. This is basically a shortcut. Some of the cameras, if you look at the top mode dial on the camera, have a C setting, like, le like letter C, like Charlie. And you can literally set the camera in any choice of exposure mode, custom functions, metering options, etc. set the camera up manually, and then go into register. And then tell it, OK, this, the 7D has three C settings, C1, 2, and 3. I can then take all those settings, tell it 
Memorize those on C, C1, for instance. It could be any of them. Let's say, say, let's say C2. And hit OK. And now, anytime I turn the dial to C2, it's going to jump to all those settings. It could be aperture priority at F11, plus a stop of exposure compensation, spot metering, you know, certain custom functions. Could be anything. And that's, it's going to jump to those right away. It's a neat shortcut. And then if I decide I want to change it, if I decide, well, that's cool, but now I'm not doing that type of shooting anymore, I can go to clear settings here, go here to C2, which is where I memorized them before, and just say, yeah, clear them. They're gone. Copyright information. You can tag images you shoot in the shooting data with your name and copyright information as well. And in this case, the camera didn't come out of the box like this. Obviously, I had to put this in. <laughs> and if you go back, you can enter your name. And it gives you, you see here, if you press the picture style button, you can toggle back and forth between this block and this block. So if you just press the picture style button, you can highlight the little font here and you can use the either the multi controller or the quick control dial and just you know hit a setting and you can you know start adding letters to it if you want to if you make a mistake hit the erase button and you literally erase them and you can enter copyright details as well in the same way it doesn't there's more here than what you see here on screen obviously and then once you're, there's a finite number of letters, you can, characters you can put in. But once that's done, just basically hit OK. Oops, hit the menu button. And you're done. If you want to change it, for instance, if you're loaning the camera to somebody else and you want to delete that, you can do that too. You can take all the information you've written and just delete it in one fell swoop. Where is that information? It goes into, the gentleman's question was, where's that information go? It goes into exactly the metadata, the text data that comes with each picture. Right. It, most third-party software programs will read that. It's, it's in the common area of metadata. And it's not a guarantee of copyright protection legally, but it does mean that if the f original file goes somewhere else, whether you send it there or somebody gets it, that information technically is there. It obviously is not a watermark on your actual image. You're not going to see a copyright notice across the picture. This is if you go into the shooting data where it says the date, the time, the shutter speed, the aperture, and all that. One of the things is going to be the photographer's name and copyright data if you've put it in. By default, it's blank. We're running a little shy on time, but I want to very quickly touch on the My Menu settings. And the custom functions, obviously, are something that a lot of people are going to have questions about. They're broken up on our recent cameras into four categories, exposure, the functions that control image quality in some way, autofocus and drive functions, and then operation functions as well. In the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over that for now. And if any of you have questions about the custom functions on the 7D, or for that matter, any of our other cameras, I'll be glad to answer your questions after we're done. But I want to skip to the last item on the agenda, which is the My Menu settings. As you've seen, most of our cameras now give you a lot of different menu items. Some of them pretty mundane that are everyday type of things that you're going to kind of set once and usually forget about, like the date and time, for instance. Others of which you may be going in and changing fairly frequently. If you're having to go into different places in the menu to make settings frequently, it can sometimes be a little time consuming. You know, in other words, you're shooting some pictures outside, you want the camera set up a certain way, so you go in and you make this setting here, this setting here, this setting here. And then maybe you go indoors and you're shooting high ISO available light. And you're thinking, okay, there's a bunch of things I want to change now. And so you go into the, here in the menu to make a change, here in the menu to make a change. It, it takes a little time. So what Canon has done is come up with an area where you can put up to six menu items that you use frequently and get to them in one place. It doesn't replace them where they were. In other words, if one of these items originally is in the first shooting menu and you put it in my menu, you haven't taken it out of here. It's still in the first shooting menu, but what you've done is you've basically created a shortcut to it. So here's how that works. If I press the set button, the first thing I see is register. Register in the Canon language basically means memorize. So if I hit register, 
it now says, okay, here is a list of items, and it's going to go through a whole bunch of things. So let's just pick a couple real quick. Let's just say um, white balance shift and bracket was something that I use a lot. Let's just say hypothetically. So if I hit my set button, it's going to ask, do I want to put that in my menu? And so I say, okay, cool. I can keep on going. Um, maybe uh, that one touch raw plus JPEG. Maybe that's another one that I use a lot and I want to be able to access and change frequently. So I hit that one and I say OK. And maybe um, formatting the memory card, certainly. Battery info. And so on. OK, cool. What I've got now, where are they? Didn't I get them? Just take a couple real quick. Yeah, I got them. Oh, duh, duh, there they are. I'm sorry. Here they are in one place. And the idea is that I can get to all of these quickly without having to go to multiple different places to find them. Now, I can still do more. Maybe format is something I'm going to do every time I put a new memory card in. So maybe I want that to the top of the menu. How do I get it there? If I go to my menu settings and say sort, I can now go to format, hit my set button. You see the two little arrows that appeared? I can now turn my quick control dial and I can move it. Hit my set button again, and bingo, format is up top. Maybe this white balance shift and bracket, I want to move down to the bottom. Maybe it's not something I use a lot, but I wanted it there. All right, fine, move it down the bottom. Hit set, bingo, it's done. I can delete any individual item here if I want to. I can delete all of them. And this last one here, display from my menu, means that if I enable it, every time I hit the menu button, no matter where I was before, the first thing it's going to show is my menu. And then I can go from there and go to one of the other tabs if I wanted to make another different setting, custom functions or whatever. If I don't have that, if I leave this on disable, what's going to happen is oops, wherever I happen to be on the menu, when I last was into the menu, if I hit the menu button again, that's where it's going to start from. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what's in the menu in a 7D. Again, a lot of our cameras are going to be similar. You may see things worded a little differently, but you're going to see many, many similar functions going from one camera model to another. The 7D does have some unique functions, as I said, that our other cameras don't. But this hopefully gives you a little bit more of an idea of what some of these things may mean, why you might want to use them. And there are going to be some of these things, quite honestly, that you'll never use. I mean, you may not own a printer, for instance. So the idea of you know printing images directly from the camera is something that's just it's, it's irrelevant to you. It doesn't matter. Okay, fine. It doesn't matter. You know, you just ignore it. Uh, there are going to be other functions that you're going to use frequently. Formatting the memory card and other things like that. Uh, and then some that just, you know, from time to time, are gonna, you're going to find a way that they're going to be very useful. And knowledge is power. The more you know about these and understand what they do, why they do it, and how they work, the better equipped you're going to be to be able to call these things up when you need them in certain specific situations. And that's a large part of what we were hoping to get to across today. Now, certainly, I'll be glad to answer any other questions that any of you have. And again, in the interest of time, we weren't able to get into the custom functions directly. But if you have questions about custom functions, come to me afterwards if you've got a few moments, and I'll be glad to go over that too. So I want to thank you folks again for coming in today and being with us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you for being with us. And, uh, you know, please, you know, enjoy the summertime. You know, go out and shoot lots of pictures. Play with the functions in your camera. Learn more about it. Try a few things that maybe you haven't tried before. And by all means, you know, the most important thing is have fun. So thank you very much. <laughs>